This is a production of Cornell University Library. Well, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Sarah Wright, Director of Man Library, and I'm here to open the final Chats in the Stats book talk that we're hosting for the spring 2022 semester. I'm so pleased to welcome all of you who are joining us today, uh, whether from on Cornell's campus or from another corner of the world entirely. Presenting for us today is Professor Kaushik Basu, who has recently published his newest book, Policymakers Journal, From Delhi to Washington, DC. The first part of this webinar will feature Professor Basu's presentation with a question and answer session to follow. Audience members can pose questions into the chat at any time during the program, and my colleague Evelyn Ferretti will present them to Dr. Basu during the Q&A period in the final 20 minutes or so of this program. Before proceeding further, I'd like to acknowledge that Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gayakono. The Gayakono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of Gayakono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Gayakono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. And now it is my pleasure and honor to introduce our speaker. Kaushik Basu is Professor of Economics and the Karl Marx Professor of International Studies at Cornell University. His involvement with international economic policy development has been extensive, having served as Chief Economic Advisor to the Indian government, Senior Vice President and Chief Economist of the World Bank, and most recently from 2017 to 2020 as President of the International Economic Association. Professor Basu re received his PhD and master's degrees in economics from the London School of Economics and his undergraduate degree with honors from Stevens College in Delhi, India. Prior to joining Cornell faculty in 1994, Professor Basu was professor of economics at the Delhi School of Economics. In 1992, he founded the Center for Development Economics in Delhi, serving as its first executive director. And in 1993, he became a founding member of the Madras School of Economics. In addition to his faculty position at Cornell, Professor Basu has held visiting positions at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, the London School of Economics, Harvard University, and MIT. In the course of a dynamic career as teacher, researcher, and policy advisor, Dr. Basu has published widely in the areas of development economics, industrial organization, game theory, and welfare economics. His publications include hundreds of articles in leading scholarly and policy journals and over two dozen books, a number of which have been translated into Chinese, Spanish, Italian, Russian, French, and other languages. Some of you may remember that a few years ago, Professor Basu honored us with a presentation about one of these titles, An Economist in the Real World, The Art of Policymaking in India, published by MIT Press in 2015. And for those of you who might have missed that talk, don't worry, you can find that recording of it in the Chats in the Stacks book talk series featured on Man's YouTube channel. In addition to his scholarly and policy work, Dr. Basu has reached a more general worldwide audience with frequent contributions to popular news outlets, including the New York Times, Scientific American, India Today, Business Standard, and BBC News Online. In recognition of his public service in 2008, Kaushik Basu was awarded one of India's highest civilian awards, the Padma Bhushan, by the President of India. I am so pleased that Dr. Basu has agreed to join us today to give us a little insight about the experience of being an engaged scholar and world citizen, working to shape and promote policy that supports full, full human development for all. Please join me in giving him a very warm welcome. Sarah, thank you. Do I take over? Thank you very much. Sarah, thank you very much. Thank you also, Evelyn, Sean, Matt. I've been interacting with the last few days for the opportunity to speak. As um, Sarah just mentioned, I've done this once before, Chats in the Stacks. With this particular book, uh, th there has been lots of uh, 
discussions, reviews, and I've been involved in meetings in different places, but there is nothing like doing it at home. I'm referring it to Ithaca, so this is very, very special for me to do this event. Thank you very much. Let me, maybe I should begin with a, a caveat uh, that this is really a diary, um, a policymaker's journal, I call it, that was decided with my publisher, but I kept it as a diary. I wrote it entirely for myself, almost as a therapeutic device. I'll explain that in a moment. I had no intention of publishing it when I was writing. It is really for my memory, and I'll explain the therapy uh, in one moment. Uh, much after I finished my stint in India and then at the World Bank in Washington, uh, I decided, and it was actually my publisher, Simon and Schuster, reaching out to me, knowing because I would refer to the fact that I kept a diary and a journal that made me think that maybe there is interesting enough material here. It is true that unlike in my other works, I do not go into any serious economics in this book. There are snippets here and there, but that's it. Um, that, let me explain the therapy part of it that I'm mentioning that when I first joined the government in India in December 2009, I used to be department chair at Cornell. And from that, I went to this. Initially, it was absolutely um, bewildering and disquieting. Uh, I'm not just talking about the fact uh, of the kind of work pressure, which was immense, but that I'm good at handling, but it is working very close to political processes. Uh, it has a culture, a much more hierarchical culture, reporting to people, the whole style. I was finding it upsetting and uh, I, did realize that if after two months of doing this job, I said that I want to resign and go away, uh, this would cause uh, embarrassment to the Indian prime minister, to others that I had quit so quickly. I was keeping a diary right from the beginning, but I told myself that treat your stay in the government of India and this experience, if nothing else, as sheer experience the way an anthropologist goes off to a distant island. If Malinowski could go to the Trobrian island and stay there for, I don't know, nine months, 10 months, I could surely stay in the government bureaucracy in India for two years, three years, if nothing else to observe the culture of the place. And I took my diary writing more seriously. So that's the sort of background to this. Um, all this began, I have to tell you, um, on the 9th of August with a complete surprise, uh, the work that I was doing. Uh, 9th of August, because uh, 9th of August uh, 2009, I was department chair at Cornell. I had gone to in, uh, India. I did go usually in summer. It was the last day of my stay. The next day I would come back when suddenly I get a phone call from the prime minister's office in Delhi. Uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh was prime minister and assistant of his phone and very quickly came to the point, which is the style of uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh anyway, saying that uh, the prime minister wants to know if I would consider being the chief economic advisor to the Indian government. I really fell back because though there was no hint of this earlier, no one had said that I was being considered, it came suddenly. So I told this lady that, look, um, I do want to consider this seriously, but this is too big a question for me to give you a straight answer on the phone. And minimally, I do want to talk to the prime minister since it's his office that is asking me to do this, to know a little bit what he has in mind, but there is one catch. Tomorrow evening, I'm going to go back to Cornell, end of my summer stay here uh, to be department chair. So there's very little time. So she said, let me call back. She hung up, must have talked to the prime minister, called back in 10, 15 minutes saying that, can you do the following? Pack up tomorrow with your bags, come to the prime minister's residence in the evening, talk to him and then go off to the airport. So I agreed and I went and met Dr. Manmohan Singh there, had a um, meeting for about 45 minutes, one-on-one -on -one with him. I did sense a sincerity of purpose in him. He said he wanted to bring the best of ideas to the table for India. He would like me to do it. He reminded me what I knew that he had once done the same job a long time ago. He wanted to build up the advisory part of India more. 
I had virtually decided by the end that I would do it. Uh, but he himself said that, look, the fact that I want you to do it does not mean that you're going to get the job for sure, because there are still checks and balances in the system. But if you give me a nodding approval, then I will start the process. I told him, I'm virtually telling you, I'll go back to Cornell and write back. And I wrote back immediately saying that if it's offered, I will take it. The government went through some process. I continued to doing my chairing. And then uh, from December, December 8th, 2009, I, it was a switch in my career of a dramatic kind. And then for seven years, I did the Indian job. I had, uh, it was a contract for two years. They asked for an extension. I did a little bit more. Uh, then I came back to Cornell for a month and then the World Bank uh, chief economist of the World Bank came, I headed for that. And so it was a seven year with a brief interlude in Ithaca was my career. Let me tell you also a bit more of the backdrop that my joining the government was for me a very dramatic um, uh, event in my life because as an economist, I'm a very academic economist. It's the academic part of it which fascinates me. And I have got friends, economists, friends who say that they came into the profession because they wanted to create a better economy, a better world. My confession is, I do write about this in the diary. I did not come in for that really. For me, um, the research is a fascination with patterns, the aesthetics of a chaotic society and trying to understand that within this chaos, there are patterns that you can understand. And it was, uh, in many ways, you would describe it as a selfish interest. Uh, it's the interest of like creating art or music. It's creating and looking at patterns in society and the economy is what fascinated me. I did that selfish pursuit for many years. So when this job came and I took it, I did tell myself that I've done this for the last, I don't know, 30 years. I've done economic research completely selfishly. I'm going to plunge into this in a very different mode, really trying to help and do as well as possible for society. And I must tell you that I do believe that in today's globalized world, our commitment should be to the world anywhere. It's not your nationality, not your religion, should be anywhere where the need is. In this case, of course, I was being asked to do it in India, so I would do it for India. That was my job, that would be my focus. And of course, it's a country I grew up in, I'm culturally rooted there, I love the country, so I would do it. But I do believe that it is our commitment as world citizens for anywhere the need arises, we should be prepared for that anyway. So I plunged in with that completely in mind. And then the initial months, as I was saying, were very difficult. Also the hierarchy of the place, the finance minister calls you, you have to go running, you have to stand there, be called in and you've got juniors, seniors. I was not used to that culture in my academic life. So it was very frustrating. There were a couple of letters. I'm wondering now if they are there in my um, uh, policymakers journal or not. If not, I can still tell you what it was. I probably do mention some. I guess I do mention that in my diary. When I was feeling very distraught and troubled and thinking, should I just quit and go back to uh, what I enjoy doing for myself? I had a letter, and this is very memorable, from uh, Robert Solo, the great economist, a handwritten letter very brief correspondence with Solo about something. And then he wrote back this lovely handwritten letter saying, Koshik, you've moved into a very different world. And then he reminded me of our larger commitment to the world. And he said, this is a big challenge. I hope you carry it out as well as you can. I found it very, very inspiring. And there was another letter, another email, which was very memorable for me because um, with Ariel Rubinstein, the game theorist, I was corresponding and I was telling Ariel that I'm finding politics just too difficult. It's not my world. So Ariel wrote to me saying that, Koshik, you have a short memory. You were department chair till a few months ago. Whenever you get fed up of national politics, think of departmental politics and how nasty that can be. And you will feel comforted. I have to say that as department chair, it was not nasty at all. I, I Maybe I did it for too brief a period, a year and a half. I got along very well with my colleagues, with my administration, et cetera. So it was great fun. So it was not really a comfort thinking of my department days, but these were my friends reaching out. Let me jump a little bit into um, the discipline, though the book is not about that. Some of um, the listeners may be interested to uh, know. Um, the book is largely about uh, the lighter things, the culture of the place, important enough and written, I tried my best with an anthropologist's eye is what I was writing. 
but there was also very, very serious economics that was coming up. And for me, as a sort of academic economist, a theoretical economist, this was very exciting to see uh, economics at play on the ground. I'll give you one or two examples of um, uh, which are all, all there in the uh, policymakers journal. Very early, within a couple of weeks of joining the Indian government, uh, the prime minister called a meeting uh, for the control of inflation. It was a meeting with just seven, eight top bureaucrats, me and the prime minister, a small room, and um, India's inflation was raging at that time. Uh, this is the kind of inflation that had last been seen in um, uh, 1973. And food inflation in particular was close to 20% per annum, which was intolerable. Um, I, I won't go into the details of what had caused it, et cetera, but the prime minister was having a meeting about uh, how to dampen the price rise. Something very concrete struck me during this seven, eight people discussion that India's food release strategy, the way the government stocks up food, like in the United States, you have gasoline being released by the government. When oil prices rise, when gas price rises, the government releases it. India sits on a stock of food grain the government sits on. And if food prices go up very high, the Indian government releases food onto the market. But you know, there is a technology of food release. How do you release, through which channels, et cetera? And I had a very concrete idea that this was being done wrong. And the origins of this idea goes back to the 19th century, 1838, precisely, to the work of Augustine Curno as to how you release this thing. And I remember at that meeting with the prime minister and seven, eight bureaucrats feeling very self-conscious. If I mentioned that this is Curno's idea, I think they would immediately switch off that this is another academic with academic ideas. So without mentioning the name of Kurno, I in plain simple English, English described the release strategy of the food grain. I think the prime minister who is an economist, he picked up immediately and quite a phenomenal mind I have to say, he picked up. And at the end of that meeting, the decision was taken that the food release technology would be done differently. And the Food Corporation of India was instructed to do that. I give this example not as an example of how advice was taken. I've got lots of advice I gave which were never taken in the government. And I don't complain. Government is a complex, big organization. Hundreds of people are giving advice. Some get taken, some go, don't get taken. This one got taken. Let me give you one more, which actually turned out to be important. I've got a bunch of them. I'm deciding which ones I will choose uh, and uh, not choose. Yeah, one more is, 3G spectrum auction. Soon after I joined government, the Indian government was about to sell 3G spectrum. I don't even know the technology of this, what it is, but I know it's something which is the government is selling onto the market. The way it was being done originally, the plan was the bureaucrats would call in experts, they would value these spectrum and then sell them at that price onto the market. I had enough of economics in me to know that one area of economics, a lot of economics is intuition, gut feeling, but one area of economics, which is like engineering science is auction. We can design auctions and United States is one of the best auction designers, design auctions so that you don't sell it off at a low price. You price it well enough, high enough, it gets priced whatever the market will bear. And I went to the prime minister, met him several times, urging him that, look, we should go for a spectrum auction instead of bureaucrats pricing it and selling it to whoever buys. And this was actually adopted. And I think the prime minister stopped me from one thing which was correct. I was trying to get some academic economists. I, I won't name just now. I had gave him some names, three, four names from United States, some of them Indians. So I said, call them in and let them do the design. They are masters at auction design. The prime minister rightly said that we want that expertise, but there's so much of organizational part when the government is doing a massive auction that we need to give it to a company that manages auction. So it was given to actually a foreign company, I think a British company, which called in specialists to do the design. And this was an enormous success. It had its fallout political criticism and all, but 
what we had valued in sitting in the uh, bureaucracy that this would fetch the government seven billion dollars when the auction was done it brought in 15 billion dollars because the auction gets extracts the market price as well as possible. Many other examples. Uh, uh, the cultural difference, let me give you one more before I read out a little bit from my uh, policymakers journal. The cultural difference, initially it was disorienting because within a month or two, I forget, maybe three months, um, uh, one day I get a note from the finance minister sitting in my office, a note comes down um, saying that Kaushik, I want a short note from you on the pros and cons of allowing futures market in grain, because the India, Indian government was considering opening up futures markets. I don't work on this. I said, I've had it. I don't understand futures markets properly. What should I do? I thought of my Cornell colleagues. I sent an email immediately to my colleagues, Larry Bloom and David Easley, saying, Larry and David, I have to write up a note on actually the design of futures markets. Should it be opened up or not? Give me some references. They were very nice. Within a day, I get references, a bunch of papers in Econometrica, Journal of Economic Theory, full of mathematics. I got those references, and I said, I've had it now. For me to read and digest this is easily a month's job. So I need about two months to write this report. I know that the government won't uh, give me two months. So as soon as I got the email from uh, Larry and David, I sent a note up to the finance minister's office saying, how much time will the finance minister give me for this report on opening up futures markets? Uh, the note came back from the finance minister again. Uh, it said, I can give you up to tomorrow evening. So let alone two months, one month, it was by tomorrow evening. Academics get frustrated that, that on an important topic like this, how can it be so quick? I understand that frustration. At the same time, the government has to take decisions. Often it's very quick decisions. There is not much choice. So I remember what I did quickly. I, I knew a little bit commonsensically as an economist, read up a little bit, and within those 24 hours, prepared a short note for the finance minister for the clarity of the pros and cons of this. That's the difference in culture. I've, talked about these serious things that I thought I will read out. The lighter moments, most of my diary is actually about lighter moments. So let me read out a little bit about an incident which clearly I didn't realize when I published this. I find that several book reviewers, people who have reviewed my book, refer to this incident soon after I joined the government, actually less than a month. So still very new. This is my diary entry I'm reading out for you from January 1st, 2010. As another new year dawns, I look back at the last few crazy weeks of my life. Inflation is raging. There is effort to rein in the fiscal deficit, which had been deliberately raised to battle the global financial downturn since 2008. And as always, Every new expenditure creates new interests that refuse to let go of the money. And so returning the deficit to where it was is turning out to be very hard. Add to all this, the super energetic Indian media is always around watching and reporting on everything we say or do. This is absolutely maddening. But in the long run, a strength that forces our leaders and bureaucrats at the top to be more transparent than they would be otherwise. The media, ever ready to contest and quiz the leaders, is India's strength. Few nations outside the advanced economies have this kind of media, and this raises India's global stature and also its long-run growth prospects. Actually, when I read this, it is a reminder of the importance of the media and how much India had benefited from this. In the midst of fighting inflation, unemployment, and hemorrhaging finance, I was involved in another battle to get access to the large, well-maintained bathroom on the first floor meant for secretaries to the government of India. The bathroom had three towel racks with three nicely laundered towels marked 
finance secretary, revenue secretary, and expenditure secretary. My two senior personal secretaries, and also the peons uh, who are assistants, and my ever loyal driver, Manbir Singh, were very upset by this. They reminded me that though I was called chief economic advisor to the government, I had the rank of a secretary. In fact, I was the only other secretary in the Ministry of Finance, apart from the three who have secretary attached to their title, finance revenue and expenditure. So instead of just using the VIP bathrooms on the ground and first floor, accessed by additional and joint secretaries, I should, they insisted, have access to the even better bathroom. It was their pride that was being hurt. I told them flatly that I did not see myself amidst discussion of inflation, inflation control and deficit management, slipping in a request to the finance minister that I be given access to the special first floor bathroom. So my personal secretaries, led by the chief of my administrative staff, the outstanding Mr. Somanathan, took it upon themselves to wage the battle. And they won. They gleefully informed me this morning, this morning. Indeed, I was pleasantly surprised to see a fourth rack with a fresh towel marked in the bathroom, chief economic advisor. There was only one downside to this bathroom. It was fairly far away from my office and along the corridor, the peons, security guards, and other officers sat on flat benches outside the offices of various senior bureaucrats. As is the custom in India, when a senior advisor or bureaucrat walks down the corridor, they all stand up and give a salute. As I left the bathroom today, to my dismay, I found them all jumping to their feet to salute me. It is an uncomfortable thought that for the next two years, I would get a salute for my performance. So that was one diary entry. Let me move back to a bit of a serious matter. I'm picking and choosing the material as I'm going. Another very uh, dramatic incident, let me say this in words, it appears in this um, um, diary of mine. I've also done some academic writing on this, and this is my academic training in the world of policy. You know one, I'm backing up a little bit. When I first got the call to be uh, a chief economic advisor to India, I did think, how come I'm being asked? I haven't, I was the first, India has had 13 chief economic advisors before me. I was the first person who had been called from completely outside the government. I had never had any government experience and I had wondered why they had asked me and I did not ask for this. I did not lobby for this. I had no interest in it. I enjoyed it when I got it finally, but I had no interest in it a priori. So why did they ask? And I do feel that they asked me because of not my academic writings, because of my popular journalistic writings. I used to write a column for BBC's online page on South Asia, very widely read. And there I would talk about important topics, policy matters, not the kinds of things that I did my research on, but popular interest in policy, and that must have attracted it. There I had a lot of interest in the problem of corruption, and I'm coming to a, a corruption related matter that uh, got me involved and brought me closest to having to resign from the India, Indian government. This was a bit more than uh, after a year I had joined the government. Since I'm assuming that much of my audience is university audience, let me give you the slightly analytical point, which to me is of great interest. And that is what got me interested. And I, I posted a paper on this, which got me into trouble. It's the following. India, has a fair amount of bribery. In everyday life, trivial things, you're asked for a bribe, you have to either give it a bribe or not give it a bribe, but it's a huge harassment. Once you come into government in a senior position, you don't encounter that at all. People are too scared to ask you for a bribe. So people who have spent their entire career in government, they may believe that there is no bribery, but if you've been an ordinary citizen like I have, there are situations, not rampant, but when you're doing your income tax returns, when you're doing this, that you'll be asked for a bribe and for no reason but harassment. I call this harassment, right? Because occasionally there are people who will ask for a, who will offer a bribe 
to do something illegitimate, illegal. But there are many things which is legal, for, but for which a bribe is asked. The simplest example is you want a driving license. You train yourself, you go for a driving test, you drive perfectly. The officer at the end of it says, you've driven very well, but before I give you the license, you have to give me a bribe. I call those harassment bribes. And here is a problem why bribery is high in India. It struck me. India has a law, which is from 1988, Prevention of Corruption Act, where the law says that in the event of bribery, the giving of a bribe and the taking of a bribe are both equally liable to punishment, both liable to criminal punishment. And it immediately struck me something, that when you're forced to give a bribe, which is a harassment bribe, nothing illegally you're asking for, but still you're asked for money. If you do give that bribe, given the Indian law, after you have given the bribe, you're not going to say so. If in the courtroom someone asks, the judge asks, did you give a bribe? You won't say it because you'll be punished under the law. So after you've given the bribe, you end up colluding with the person who took the bribe from you, even though you hate that person, you collude in hiding that fact. If the law is changed, whereby the bribe giving is made legal and the bribe taking is declared illegal, it would change the dynamics of this altogether because after giving a bribe, you'll be free to say that I had to give a bribe because for me, this is not a criminal act. Knowing that the bribe taker will hesitate in taking a bribe, so bribery would go down. I wrote a note, posted it on the Ministry of Finance website saying that the law ought to be amended whereby bribe giving should not be considered illegal. It sounds awful. This created absolute furor. There were members of parliament writing to the Indian prime minister saying that I should be asked to quit my job because it was such an immoral idea which I had posted on the website. And there was one evening when a popular television channel asked me to appear on TV and explain my ideas. That was the evening when I decided I better phone the prime minister. I would get to see the prime minister in India roughly once a month, once in six weeks. But I thought this is important enough. I should ask his advice because I know people had written to him asking that I should be asked to quit government. So it was a Saturday evening. I called the prime minister's residence. Someone said, I'll check if the prime minister can get back. The prime minister came online. I told him, prime minister, uh, there is this idea. I have not talked to you about this, which I had posted, which I know you've received letters about. Can I go on television and explain this idea and defend this idea? And all? The prime minister immediately, his first reaction was, Toshik, I have to tell you, I've read about your idea in newspapers, not your paper, and I disagree with your idea. I tried to explain to the prime minister two, three times, prime minister, you have to read my paper, not the newspaper things. He said, no, I, I just think declaring bribe giving as legal is not right. How much can you argue? I backed down, I said, okay, uh, you don't agree with me. And then he added something that though I disagree with you, if you think it's a good idea, and I know you've caused me some discomfort by talking about it, but it is fine for you to talk about it and to defend it and explain to people you should feel free to do so. I remember that was a very memorable moment to be told that I disagree, but still, despite the fact that I disagree, you can express your idea and try to defend in public was marvelous. And that moment, and there were other times, I have to tell you this one um, um, uh, matter that I have to touch on, my diary does talk about this, is working with Dr. Manmohan Singh, the prime minister was remarkable. Uh, he is not a politician at all, it is working with a person of Kantian ethics, and I'm re referring to Immanuel Kant. He was a person of Kantian ethics. Politics is very difficult for a person who has that kind of ethics to do. And many will say he was an unsuccessful politician. He didn't have the intrigue of politics. But working with him for me, I have no instant, instinctive respect for a politician. I would not respect just because the person is a political leader. But working with Dr. Manmohan Singh for me was just wonderful because of his genuine commitment to what he was trying to do. Okay, let me, I'm just thinking, I'm looking at the time and thinking what else should I do? Let me read out one more. Now, this is after joining the World Bank. Let me tell you a bit of the background of joining the World Bank. I had finished my, I was into my last days in the Indian job when I suddenly got a phone call from Washington. The World Bank had a new um, uh, president, uh, Jim Kim, and someone phoned me 
from Jim Kim's office, one of his assistants. It later on turned out to be, it was a Sikh gentleman, a Sardarji, an Indian Sikh gentleman. One of his assistants called me and said, uh, Professor Basu, the World Bank president is very keen to talk to you, a whole lot of things he wants to discuss. Is it possible for you to come to Washington and have a meeting with him? I said, you know, these are my last days in the government and I, I can't really travel all the way to Washington to discuss. I thought that the World Bank president wants to talk to me about um, Indian economy. He's just become president a few months before that. Maybe he's talking to the chief economists of different countries, getting a briefing on economies around the world. So I said, I want to talk, want to help him, but I can't come to Washington for this. He called back the next day or two days later, again, reaching out to me saying that anyway, short trip, we will of course cover your trip, et cetera. I said, no, I can't do it. Then the third occasion, I said, you have to tell me what is it? Why is he so keen to talk? And must by then he must have got permission. He said that, well, he wants to offer you the job of chief economist of the World Bank. And among other things, he wants to talk about this. I said, look, I have greater interest in talking about this, of course, but still I don't want to go. So a meeting was set up in London where he was coming and I went. Uh, we had a meeting in London, uh, st stayed at the airport hotel, had a meeting with him about the World Bank job. And he again said that, no, this will still take three months to go through all the process for it to be formally approved. I returned to Cornell, did a little bit of teaching. And then three months later, I joined the World Bank. And that was once again, a very different kind of experience. Um, and I write about this. This is traveling all over the world. In small countries, you're going, you're meeting, sitting with, um, important person, a finance minister, prime minister, president taking decisions. There were dramatic meetings. I talk about them, some actually very, very um, emotionally in retrospect taxing for me. In Nicaragua, in Managua, it's almost embarrassing. But you know, when I had the meeting, I did not know. I was very keen to meet with President Daniel Ortega, the president of the country. I had gone on World Bank work. I was doing World Bank uh, meetings and I sent a message. I said that in case it's possible to meet with Daniel Ortega, I had watched his revolution, uh, overthrowing the Sandinista, uh, the Sandinista revolution, overthrowing Somoza, sitting in Calcutta. Then later on, while I was a student in the, at the London School of Economics, I had watched and there are matters of policy, but I also would like to meet Daniel Ortega last day. Uh, when I was in uh, uh, Managua, I got a message suddenly in the middle of a World Bank meeting saying that the president would like to meet you. So I went and had this long meeting with him, uh, just meeting about a couple of matters that we had to sort out and then about the Sandinista revolution, etc. But in retrospect, you must be reading, it's turned out to be a bizarre rule. It's a brutal regime uh, under uh, Daniel Ortega. People being arrested, it's the morphing of uh, this leader who had led some of the revolution into something grotesque, which I just look, look back and shudder. And there were a couple of other meetings of that kind. It's a great experience during this period, ups and downs. Uh, let me read out, um, I'm just looking once again at the time, I will read uh, two things maybe um, from this. Let me read one because Madeleine Albright has just uh, passed away. Um, I, I, I think we touched a chord. I met her several times uh, and I did like her. She was a shrewd thinker, hard thinker, but I got the impression with prominent leaders, how do you know beyond a point you do not know the mind, but unlike many others, I felt her shrewdness came with a moral compass. She would use it for an ethical purpose. She had made mistakes, policy mistakes, but I felt she was. Here was my meeting with Madeleine Albright, I'm reading out from 14th February, 2013, when I'm in Washington. I went to meet Madeleine Albright, and this also has a very funny episode about Madeleine Albright's uh, visit to North Korea. So let me quickly read this to you. I went to meet Madeleine Albright in her office, Albright Stonebridge Group at 5 p.m. It turned out to be a wonderful meeting. We talked about world affairs and the role of politics in development. We also spoke at length about North Korea, she said she was the highest level US government official who had been there. It was a slightly chilling feeling once there to be completely uh, in their charge since USA did not have an embassy there. 
I prodded her about how it was interacting with Kim Jong-il. She said, at an individual level, she found him quite personable. Kim had organized a special dance program for her in which a group of Korean women, women dancers wearing red dresses would huddle together. When they broke out of the huddle, the clothes which probably had Velcro straps would be turned inside out and they would all be in green dresses. Then after another round of huddling, they would be in red again. On one such round, the Velcros probably got stuck and one girl came out half red and half green. Kim Jong-il got so angry that Madeleine Albright had to calm him down, assuring him that these things happen in life. Good training in diplomacy has its uses. Madeleine Albright said that her only disappointment was that the agreement they reached was not carried out by Kim. She felt that the North Koreans were gaming her. I pointed out that it was possible that no one among the North Koreans were individually gaming her, but they were caught in a collective trap, the leaders of North Korea. It is possible that Kim wanted to carry out the agreement, but he himself was in a trap. If he did, if he did do so, his generals might have turned against him, and that could be dangerous for him. And his generals may have behaved the way they did because they were in turn caught in their own trap. She thought a bit and said that that is possible because the intricacies of foreign policy can be so complex. We got along well. I uh, asked her to come to give a public lecture at the World Bank, and she promptly agreed. Let me read out, if there is time and question and answer, I could go into other things, but maybe it is best for me to read out the postscript, which I do want to read out, which is after I'm back in Ithaca. So this is the end of my diary. I will read this out and the formal part is more or less done and depending on q and I I can um, yeah, decide how we will do this. So let me read, I'm reading out literally the last entry in my diary, but it is not a diary entry anymore. Uh, uh, not the diary of the policymaker because this is from 10th of December, 2020. And I'm back in Ithaca. Growing up in a traditional Indian household in Calcutta, around the time that I did, an early scientific conundrum that all children confronted was when they asked the mother how yogurt, a staple of Indian diet was made and were told that the key ingredient was a little bit of previously made yogurt. Some children, I suppose the lucky ones, went away skipping, satisfied with the answer. The typical question that arises in the world of policymaking and the answer one gets is a bit like the above secret of how to make yogurt. It involves using some previously made yogurt so you never ever get to the secret. It is satisfying only if you are not interested in the next question. How did that first round of yogurt get made? Infinite regress fascinates me, and I'm interested in the next question and the next. Trying to change the world can be gratifying, but trying to understand it is sheer joy. It had been seven years of packing myself to the brim with observation, information, and facts. I scarcely had a moment to pause and reflect on them. I was beginning to get impatient for that opportunity and cannot deny a sense of excitement at being back in the modern day Agora, the world of learning, questioning and debate. I'm referring to Ithaca, of course. Sitting in Ithaca, putting finishing touches to a diary that I stopped writing more than four years ago with Thanksgiving behind us and Christmas around the corner, watching the few pedestrians in the deserted streets masked and socially distanced, and taking in the news of a world torn asunder by pandemic and polarized politics, I cannot help wondering at how dramatically our world has changed in such a short time. Then as now, we talked about poverty and deprivation, disease and well-being, and policies to combat those challenges. 
but today's concerns have an urgency an immediacy that we did not have then when i was busy designing policies by the day and making these hurried jottings in my diary by night thanks to the pandemic coming atop the dramatic advances in digital technology we are now asking existential questions and considering the prospect of human beings facing an existential risk that we did not imagine then it is time to ask big questions and seek answers this is a time for exciting research and philosophical investigations i feel a ray of hope that this experience especially of the past year will mark a turning point for human kind it will make us shake us out of our selfishness and complacency spark new forms of science and understanding of how the economy works and how societies cohere and promote a deeper understanding of morality and ethics which were the mainspring of economics at the time of the scottish enlightenment some progressive thinkers have argued that growth has to slow down if we want to win the war against climate change i do not agree with that i believe this stems from the mistake of equating economic growth with more cars more homes and more luxury boats in reality a constituent of gdp or the national income is anything we value longer life better health the conquest of pain art music time to ponder the wonders of the universe can all be part of the gdp hence rapid growth can mean growth in these kinds of consumption just as the world is growing much faster now than we did before the industrial revolution i expect our national incomes will grow much faster in the future than now but the constituents of that growth will be novel this will be predicated on and accompanied by a lot of creative research in economics and novel ways of thinking about the economy this will also be accompanied by huge amounts of research in medicine and healthcare in general as robots and artificial intelligence displace mechanical and routine forms of labor human beings will move more and more into research and creative activities i also believe that our survival will depend on more radical and progressive policies with vast redistributions of income and wealth from the rich to the poor making for a more equitable world just as the 100 odd years of the industrial revolution was accompanied by the most seminal breakthroughs in economics from adam smith to karl marx and also with radical or what at that time appeared radical policies such as giving workers minimal work rights and stopping children below the age of 10 from doing hard labor and taxing the incomes on the rich we shall see or what radical or what will appear to us as radical policies at a fundamental level today's concerns are the same the urgency is new we need passion and determination to fight and combat exploitation corruption hate and ill will but that is not enough we have to combine those emotions with intellectual commitment scientific discourse the willingness to dissect and analyze with patience it is for this reason that the two worlds i inhabit those of activism and policy making and research and analysis are deeply intertwined human beings need the intellect as well as the moral compass we must invest in both to combat the immediate challenges that we are faced with now and our long term challenges of poverty inequality and discrimination thank you kashi thank you so much that was thoroughly enjoyable thoroughly enjoyable i really really appreciate that and i um i am stuck on better is more that is a uh, that is a that is going to be my new motto <laughs> for for the future. Um we do have a number of questions for you. Um and so I will just dig right in. I'm going to actually uh encourage my name is Evelyn Ferretti. I'm, so, I'm sorry I haven't I haven't introduced myself. But my name is Evelyn Ferretti. I am the Public Programs and Communication Administrator at Mann Library and I am here to present uh to Professor 
Uh, so the questions that we have um, that we have come in for us, and I will present them pretty much in, in the in in the um, in order received. So I will start with my first one um, from Kamal. Professor Basu is one of the few intellectual people with a wide array of academic and non-academic experience, including becoming a chief economist to the government. He mentioned in his talk that he had some struggles when serving for the Indian, Indian government. Would he ever, would you, Koshik, ever consider writing an academic article on the optimal design of governance in the sense of maximizing welfare? What is the best system in your opinion? Thank you. Evelyn uh, Kamal, I can very briefly uh, react to this. I actually do believe that, that the way that politics is going around the world with the rise of authoritarianism, there is actually uh, among the economic problems which I'm involved in, of course, hand in gloves because of my profession, uh, there is a big need for governance with democracy. The understanding the architecture of this is a huge topic not my field, but I take some tangential interest. There's one very minor thing I can tell you, which I'm wondering again, if it's mentioned in my diary, one thing which just in the Indian administration used to, uh, uh, I used to think about is the Indian democracy in many ways is a very vertical democracy. So for every permission, things move up and down all the way to the finance minister for important things to the prime minister, but most of the time not to the prime minister, but to the finance minister, trivial things, small things. I will approve, someone else will approve, someone below me will approve, it'll go to the finance minister, finance minister will approve. I had argued that a minimum thing that should be done, and this was really my experience at, at the university, at Cornell, the relative efficiency of the bureaucracy is, it's partitioned. There are domains where I take a decision. I control this money, I take a decision. Someone else controls the money, takes that decision. There isn't this vertical hierarchy of permission taking. So you can have a, partitioned democracy, where there are little bits of decision different people are taking, but everything is not getting a clearance from the top, or a completely pyramidical structure, and India was close to that. So there are little ideas of that kind that are there mentioned in this, but I today feel when I'm looking at the world, and this is really a change that has taken place after I left, the rise of authoritarianism just around the world is making us feel that is there something in the structure of political economy, the sort of analytical models we used, the median voter theorem that economists and some political scientists use, has that gone out of date? Do we have to go back to the drafting board and rethink? So it's a big topic. I don't have an easy answer, but yes, Kamal, I agree that we ought to invest time in this. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Basu. This uh, next question is from Martha. Could you tell us whether you did indeed go on TV to talk about your bribery reform proposal? And if so, how did it go? Uh, no, I, actually, I was saving time at that point. I didn't want to keep that hidden. After the prime minister gave me the permission, he said, it's up to you, you should feel free. I did not. And let me just very quickly explain. I was actually in, in a lot of the public forum, but I just used my judgment. The prime minister left it to my judgment. And I thought that instead of my trying to explain it on TV, I would not be able to do that. If you've ever watched an um, Indian evening television debate, Debate is completely the wrong word. It's a screaming match. People just shout at each other, uh, shouting down the other side. So I, in retrospect, thought that would not be worthwhile. So I wrote about it. And that idea of mine actually got a lot of international coverage. The Economist magazine wrote about it. Lamont wrote about it. The Indian newspapers were writing. And I was in many other forums. But that debate where the person who had asked me is a very prominent television person, Barkha Dutt. She is really one of the most phenomenal television personalities. I apologize to Barkha and I said, I, I don't feel like churning this up again, so I did not. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> um, next question is from Apita. How did you make peace with yourself on, the, on a day-to-day -day basis going from an institution like Cornell to a government with hierarchies? How did you deal with the process of how work is done? Yeah, so the, the hierarchy part of it did trouble me. But I had to soon tell myself that, you know, you can't run a government without hierarchy. There are people in the government who, when they get a call from me, they have to come running whatever they are doing, they drop and coming. When the finance minister or the prime minister calls me, you drop and you go running to meet. 
that's the way it is. You wait outside the door, you're called in at some point. So it is a structure that uh, I didn't like it. I, I don't care for that style, but I had to tell myself, and this is, I think, true. A, a big administration like this, even in the university, I don't work on the administrative side. Where there is the administrative side, you will have to have a certain amount of hierarchy in the government. It's deeper, stronger in um, the World Bank also, but not as much as the Indian government. The Indian government is a bit more, it is the old British colonial uh, Commonwealth legacy of that style, uh, which had persisted. World Bank also, of course, had a lot of hierarchy. You're running a big administration. So I got used to that. And there were some comical things in the style, which you have to finally put down as comical, one which I've written about. See, there is this, um, who can go into whose room is when there's something urgent, is pretty well known. Uh, I have just joined government. So occasionally the senior people reporting to me, they would come into my door. I remember once very early, there was a very important thing and I had to see the finance minister immediately. Finance minister used to sit one floor above mine in the same building. So, so I went running up to the door and the attendant at the finance minister door was, was there at the door. I went to the door, I was about to bang on the door the attendant rushed up and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm knocking because I need to talk to the finance minister. So he said that if you need to the, talk to the finance minister, then why are you knocking and disturbing him? Just go in. You know, coming from America, going into someone's office, the finance minister working over there, suddenly by opening the door and bursting into the room is a very strange feeling. But I realized that in India, I and a few other senior people had the right to go into the finance minister's office and knocking was considered bad manners. It, it, I used to find that very difficult. Occasionally, my senior people would also come into my room, just fling open the door and come in when it's something urgent. But you know, these things are more comical than anything else. And at some point I realized there's maybe something positive to the Indian side. In America, you knock first, then you're told to come in, you waste 15 seconds. In India, you don't waste those 15 seconds. You bust open the door and you go in. Well, that seems wise too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, this question is from Hester. Kaushik, you talked about the vibrant Indian media and the critical role it played. However, there seems a worrying trend that its role has the, as the watchdog has greatly diminished. During COVID in particular, the media amplified the government propaganda and it did not adequately criticize go the government's policies. Do you echo this concern? I do echo this concern. It worries me because um, it's of course not in the immediate interest of the government to leave the space for the media because silencing the media is of advantage to the immediate administering of the state. But most of the time, there are exceptions or everything in history virtually has exceptions. There are exceptions, but most of the time, this kind of a control backfires on the economy. And even apart from the economy, I feel the space for free criticism is extremely important. Some of the best ideas come out of that. So yes, I do have this concern in a big way. All right, and this is a question from Syed. Professor Basu, what do you think are some of the biggest challenges that the subcontinent economies face? And what, can, what do you think can be done to solve these challenges? Many challenges, different challenges across the countries. But one thing I can tell you, uh, which um, for political reasons, I could not push enough when I was in the Indian government. One dimension on which the entire Indian subcontinent does very poorly compared to some other parts of the world is trade and interaction across countries and borders in that cluster or seven or eight South Asian countries, the eight sub countries, depending on how you count. Um, I did calculations when I was sitting in uh, the government that if we produced electricity in the Indian mountains, uh, in Nepal, sitting in Nepal, we generate electricity using maybe some Chinese equipment uh, in Nepal, the electricity gets used in India and part of it also goes to Pakistan. You can do out of that. You can provide a lot of electricity. If India can use the Northeastern India and then the port in Bangladesh, in Dhaka, have Indian goods exiting from that port, India would do very well. In general, I took the Mekong Delta as an example of the cluster of countries in the Mekong Delta, which were doing very well by trading and interacting and using the strengths of one another. The Indian subcontinent does very, very poorly on that. 
which is a great pity. And if politics usually gets in the way, I won't allow your people, I don't want your goods, I won't. But here one has to use a little bit of hard-headed thinking that yes, our politics may be different, but we still ought to interact. One of the initiatives that I did get a bit involved in, uh, but actually the uh, chief person who was who had started this and doing it, one time student of mine in Delhi, he recently died of natural causes, very tragic, was intellectual engagement uh, between the South Asian countries. So that this was for students of economics from all these countries, eight countries being brought every year to one place for at least the conversation to happen. And I got this idea from an initiative that used to take place in Copenhagen uh, called the Niels Bohr Initiative where Russian scientists and American scientists and a smattering from other countries were brought together that no matter how little conversation there is between the political leaders, we as thinkers ought to interact. So I'm just giving you some examples, but in terms of detailed policies, I do write occasionally about Bangladesh, uh, a lot about India, occasionally a little about other countries. Yes, there are many, many initiatives to be taken. All right, thank you. This next question is from Ishan. We do have a couple more questions and I think we have time for a couple more. Ishan, what difference have you seen in the way in which people look at policy problems, comparing academicians to practitioners and people in India to people elsewhere? Policy problems, that's the one thing about academics, since I straddle both worlds, occasionally we are too academic in the policy world. Uh, I have, on occasions, I've called in academic economists when I was in the Indian government, when I was in the World Bank, I was bringing in people regularly, uh, professors and all to come and interact with policymakers. Occasionally you get such academic advice being told about theorems and axioms in this conversation and being impatient that others are not taking enough interest in this. This much, of course, empathy you have to have for the other side that we are trained to think differently. You have to, on these occasions, you have to talk differently and interact differently. One thing which I have to say, I, my personally going in from the academic world to the policy world, I realized I came to appreciate in a very big way uh, an observation of John Maynard Keynes about the two worlds of academe and um, uh, um, policy. Uh, Keynes says towards the end of the general, um, his general theory in the last chapter, very beautifully written line, I mean, Keynes is such a master writer, that the biggest stumbling block for progress is not vested interests, it is ideas. People have frozen ideas in their head it is writings of some past era, which have got into people's heads and that blocks new ideas to be brought in. And that's a bigger stumbling block than vested interests. When as an academic, I used to read this line by John Maynard Keynes, I used to think that this is a bit of a self-serving line by a professor saying that, look, more important than um, um, vest, uh, vested interest is the ideas that get generated. But I, ironically changed my mind on this when from being a professor, I went into the policy world and I sat of course endlessly with secretaries, with ministers discussing policies and policy interventions. And I can tell you by a wide measure, the biggest stumbling block is people are used to the way they think and that has got set. So if you suggest that let us do the auction a bit differently, let us release food grains a bit differently, the biggest stumbling block comes from people who are used to doing it differently and they will say no. And if they are powerful, they will block you. So this intermeshing of the world of academe and policy is extremely important. And I feel the United States does this much more than India. Uh, India and most developing countries, I feel it is very, very important. And this was Manon Singh's idea, not my idea, to bring an infusion of people from outside and let them go back outside again. So three, four years, people from academe, researchers being brought into the government, you inject ideas and then you get out of this. This interface between the world of research and policy ought to be encouraged. Somewhat related to that, um, Professor Basu, is, uh, is this question. Um, it, you, you spoke of, uh, of, of um, policies that were not taken, that, 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 that were discarded. Your, your policies. Is there any one, in, in hindsight now, looking back at this, these years, uh, that, you, or that is most lamentable, that you feel most that, uh, that we really should have done, uh, that one would have been you know, so important? Uh, any, any one that comes to mind in particular? 
Yeah, there's one which stands out, uh, but I realize in retrospect that it's hopeless, but I still keep my fingers crossed that someday it'll come in. It's the revision of the corruption law that I suggested. Uh, later on, after that conversation with the prime minister, I sat with him and I think he saw my reasoning behind it. But it was impossible to write down in the books that giving of harassment bribe is a legitimate activity. No politician would be able to carry that forward. And there were people, there were politicians who I respect, who wrote back scathing attacks, very upset by this. And I understand that it's the wording sounds wrong. So this did not get accepted. I was a bit hopeful that it would get changed subsequently, but it has not happened. But there are other countries and other examples from sex trade to a drug trade where the punishments are asymmetric on the buyer and the seller. So there are examples around the world of uh, these tweaks in the law, which have made a big difference, but this did not move at all. There were very few people who spoke up for me. I do remember there was, I was very grateful for that. The, since he was a, a, a member of the board of trustees of Cornell, I should mention Narayan Murthy, the founder of Infosys, who really played a role in transforming India's information technology sector. He wrote, he stuck his neck out and said this suggestion sounds awful, but actually this ought to be considered seriously. So there were a couple of other people who wrote, but no, it was hopeless. Mm -hmm. So these uh, these are going to be the last, this will be the last question. It's actually two questions and I'm not actually, they're a little bit related, so I'll put them together. Um, the, starts with sitting in the calm of Ithaca, do you miss the hustle and bustle of policymaking in India and Washington? And Attached to that, this last question, it's a, it's a, it's a nice one to end on. Um, Professor Basu, thank you for the talk. And we're just curious to know that after achieving so many milestones in your life, what is your primary goal now to solve? And what do you seek to achieve in the future? Do I miss the hustle and bustle? The short answer is no, I, I don't. I have enjoyed it. Seven years of that observation, that being in the midst of this, I had enjoyed it. I don't miss that. I. I enjoy my current life. And I'll tell you another thing, which I'm virtually quoting. There is a beautiful line in Fintan O'Toole's recent piece in uh, New York Review of Books, where he says, Angela Merkel somewhere says, I never met her, but uh, yeah. Angela Merkel says that I have an active uh, life inside my head that actually allows me to take on a lot of the hustle and bustle of life. And I like to believe that right now, the um, uh, uh, just looking at the world and bringing some of this experience and thinking about the challenges that the world faces does have create a hustle and bustle and engagement, which I enjoy very much. And also I am really glad to be back in the world, which is a relatively flat world, hierarchy uh, free world. And I like the world of ideas, I'm back in there. For my goal, you know what, strangely enough, when I first came back, um, a lot of my work that I was doing, if you look at the sort of first two, three years after I came back from the World Bank, I was writing a lot on policy and I still do. I write my columns, the newspaper columns and all on policy. But what has got me interested in some very deep questions, I don't know if it's folly at this stage to throw myself into this, which is a broad interface between many disciplines, economics, law, politics, and philosophy, uh, moral philosophy. Uh, it's got me fascinated. Uh, and, and the tool of analysis is game theory into this. When I really look at the polarized politics in the world, look at United States around the world, look at authoritarian leaders around the world and authoritarian leaders waiting in the wings around the world. It's a frightening state of the world. How do you solve it? The lay person's belief always is you blame individuals. We have to do this, we have to do that. True, we have to do this, we have to do that. But who will do it? There is a collective problem. And I discovered after coming back, after I had begun to write, and actually this happened with an invitation, a casual invitation from the philosophy department at Cornell to chat about things. And I was talking of group moral responsibility, where each of us feels strongly that we should change this, but none of us can do anything individual. How do you address those problems? That is the interface of these many disciplines. My interest, I have to admit, is in, on the intellectual side of it. Is there a beautiful idea? And I'm giving bombastic examples. Think of trying to understand the market before Adam Smith. It's a chaotic market you're looking at all around the place. Then it suddenly strikes Adam Smith that there is order inside this chaos. 
Augustine Kurno looking at oligopolies, which are chaotic oligopolies, it strikes him that there is some order inside this. And if we understand this, we can regulate, we can regulate the invisible hand. I feel there is a challenge of this kind in the political economy domain to understand. And without understanding, even if each individual wants to change, we'll remain trapped in a prisoner's dilemma. So this is a huge challenge. I'm not being foolish enough to think that there will be a breakthrough, but thinking about it is great fun. And teaching and doing that is keeping me occupied. And I'm beginning to write little bits and pieces in this area of interface between disciplines. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Basu. So with that, our question and answers are concluded and uh, Sarah Wright will take over again. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thanks so much, Evelyn. And, and thank you all for uh, your wonderful questions. And, and my special thanks uh, to you, Kashuk, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, it feels feels very timely and important uh, to be learning a little more closely about the experiences involved in a career dedicated to making good policy happen on international as well as national, national levels. Um, so before closing, I'd, I'd just like to mention to the audience that Professor uh, Basu's presentation has been recorded and will be available for viewing on Man Library's YouTube channel. Um, and I believe Evelyn might be posting the URL for that um, for that into the chat right now. So please feel free, of course, to pass that link along to anyone uh, who might have missed today's chat. Um, and thank you again. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Thanks you again. This has been a production of Cornell University Library.